London has always been a city at the forefront of worldwide progress. But did you know a menacing stink threatened to tear it apart? Between 1800 and 1850, London's population more than doubled, making it one of the largest cities in the world, but it was ill-equipped to deal with the sudden influx of people. There was no centralized sewage management system for all of London, and as late as the 1800s, human waste had been dealt with by moving it out of public view. Rivers like Fleet, Walbrook, and especially Thames turned into sewers and remained that way for centuries. A lack of planned housing and infrastructure caused a crowded population to live with filthy streams, ditches, and drainage pipes still made of wood, while many of these sewers led to cesspits and cesspools that were prone to explosions and the buildup of methane gas. Many editorial columns and cartoonists detailed how the once majestic Royal River had been turned into an opaque and pale brown fluid. It was the most polluted waterway in the world, filled with human excrement, urine, animal carcasses, and industrial waste. High tide threw the detritus back at the city as fecal matter gathered on the surface of the water nearby bridges. The introduction of the flushing toilet did not help. Overwhelming old cesspools with water and waste and pushing more effluent into the river. To make matters worse, improvements in the water supply allowed the new invention to become standard in most British houses, which brought far more waste into the water system. And in response, London built some of the world's most beautiful 19th century buildings, known as cathedrals of sewage. And today, we'll discover what remains. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. You might be surprised to find out that during the 19th century, people didn't seem to mind their beloved river becoming so dirty as long as the waste was carried away from them. They didn't believe that overflowing waste in a body of water spread deadly diseases. Rather, they subscribed to the miasma theory, which said it was the foul smell that spread sickness. The theory was even supported by leading public health figures at the time including Florence Nightingale and Edwin Chadwick. Chadwick himself said, quote, all smell is disease and supported bypassing cesspools altogether and flushing waste directly into the Thames. The results were more than disastrous. What's important to note is that many Londoners drank water piped directly from this river. In other words, all that waste and bacteria was ingested on a daily basis. Even water piped from outside the city and from wells deep within the ground risked contamination from old sewer pipes. This led to the outbreak of multiple waterborne diseases, such as dysentery, typhoid, and cholera. Cholera was especially feared, as there was no known cure for it at the time. The first cholera epidemic was from 1831 to 1832. It killed over 6,000 Londoners, before another epidemic in 1848 to 1849 claimed 14,000 lives. A third outbreak from 1853 to 54 took another 10,000, and all throughout it was blamed on miasma in the air. There was one scientist, however, who was bold enough to question the popular ideas of the time and conducted his own research, Dr. John Snow. Credited as the founder of modern epidemiology, investigated the cholera outbreak in 1849 when he noticed that death rates were higher in areas with water provided by two of the same companies. Hence, he began to deduce that the water supply might be the problem and published his findings, but no one took him seriously. He got to work again during the 1854 outbreak, observing a high number of deaths in Broad Street, Soho. Upon further investigation, he found the locals were all drinking water from the same communal pump. The water had been contaminated through a crack in the brick of the nearby cesspool. So when he dismantled the pump so that no one could use it, the deaths on that street stopped. On top of this, all 70 of the workers from the local brewery who only drank beer survived the supposed airborne epidemic. He was sure that the cholera there was caused by the contaminated water and was a waterborne disease. 
Hence, he once again published his findings, feeling that they were ironclad, yet once again was met with disagreement and scrutiny from the public health officials. Even so, the idea of miasma had become too popular a belief to disprove of, and so it was clear something monumental had to be done. Dr. Snow died in June of 1858, but that same season, all of his work would be proven true. The summer of 1858 was a particularly hot summer, and everyone was feeling it and smelling it. Years of waste dumped into the Thames, left it ripe for some summer heat to ferment that nasty soup into some unholy stew. The result was an awful smell that permeated all of London. The city was brought to a standstill for weeks while Parliament struggled with what to do. Conveniently, the House of Commons was located right next to the river for all of their smelling needs. They tried to fight the smell by soaking their curtains in lime chloride, but to no avail. They even considered evacuating the newly constructed house in Westminster for better smelling air in Oxfordshire. Some politicians had already fled to the countryside, but the smell ultimately decided for them that something needed to be done. They were spurred to action, quickly approving new infrastructure for the city sewer system. They thought the miasma posed too big a threat, but if that was actually the case, London would have seen an even bigger epidemic than what it was experiencing before. A catastrophic amount of death and disease should have occurred, but it didn't, proving Dr. Snow was right. But miasmatists were right about one thing. The smell of the city was connected to its health, and something needed to change. The result was one of the greatest advancements in urban and sewer planning the world has ever seen. Until then, no one had the authority nor the capital to address as extensive a problem as sanitation in London. But the very same year, Parliament tasked the recently formed Metropolitan Board of Works with building a new waste drainage system, giving them 2.5 million pounds, or about 3 million pounds in today's money. The chief engineer of the board, Joseph Bazalgette, already had spent years designing and redesigning plans for a new, ambitious sanitation system, only for each and every one to get thrown out the window. He already had a renowned designer and engineer with land drainage experience, and now was his chance to do what he had always wanted. He proposed a network of main sewers running parallel to the river, which would receive both surface water and waste. The tunnels ran over 1,000 miles, dropping two feet in elevation for every mile in order for gravity to help move the waste. Because of this, the tunnels got deeper and deeper underground until the waste had to be pumped up and back into the Thames at one of the various pumping stations. With this plan, all manner of waste would get easily flushed outside the city, where it would drift out to sea. The Victoria, Albert, and Chelsea embankments were built in the Thames to narrow the river, increasing the flow through the city center in the hopes of cleansing it. They were also big enough to house tunnels of their own, adding to the intricates of the system. Similar narrowing was done in the tunnels to encourage the gravity-powered flow, but those same tunnels also got large, even bigger than train tunnels built around the same time. Suffice it to say that Bezeljet's system used a lot of bricks, 318 million. It was so many that London faced a brick shortage while the wages of bricklayers increased by 20%. Pumping stations were built at Chelsea, Deptford, Crossness, and Abbey Mills to raise sewage from lower areas of the sewers and alleviate pressure when they overflowed. Crossness and Abbey Mills, however, were architecturally magnificent and were dubbed cathedrals of sewage. Crossness pumping station was designed by Joseph Bazalgette and Charles Henry Driver and was surprisingly monumental for a building designed to handle raw sewage. Created in an Italianate and Romanesque design with spiral staircases, cast iron columns, rounded arches, and ornamental gardens, the ironwork was intricate, painted with bright colors, and bore the initials of the Metropolitan Board of Works all over it. It even had screens ornamented with figs because of their laxative effects. 
When it was opened in 1865 by Edward, Prince of Wales, and later King Edward VII, it was immediately the most beautiful sight around, a tower visible for miles. Its four giant steam-powered beam engines were some of the largest in the world, and each are named after a member of the royal family, Victoria, Prince Consort, Alexandra, and Albert Edward. Abbey Mills was made in a more Byzantine style, designed by Basil Jett, Driver, and Edmund Cooper. It was finished in 1868 and had a similar allure to crossness. Both stations were symbolic of the grandeur of the whole project and Victorian sensibilities. But that wasn't the last of his contributions, as he also designed London's notorious stink pipes. Stink pipes were massive, hollow iron pipes made to vent noxious gases that gathered beneath the city streets. These included methane, hydrogen sulfide, and ammonia. All were smelly and all were inflammable. So as to prevent the cesspit explosions of the past, hundreds of these pipes were built, reaching deep below ground into the new sewer systems of the time to alleviate the pressure. Stink pipes were primarily located along the path of main sewer lines where the lines of different pipes converged. Their tall street fixtures not easily missed. Standing at six to eight meters high, tall enough to disperse the gas without anyone smelling it down below. One might mistake it for a street lamp if not some of its ornate Victorian features. Well, most were painted gray or green, each pipe had a unique design. Sporting fluted columns, studded rings, a rose, or gold trim. But since they were all mainly designed, built, and supplied by London-based manufacturers, such as Hambaker or Fred Bird & Company, small plaques can be found bearing the names at the base of these pipes. So after all this work, was it worth it? Well, when cholera reared its ugly head in 1866, most of London was spared, except for East End, the only area that wasn't yet connected to the sewer system. They were more than successful at keeping contaminated waste away from sources of drinking water. So with the sewers fully operational, cholera was virtually eradicated. For his groundbreaking work, Bazalgette was knighted in 1874, becoming Sir Joseph Bazalgette. He considered the London sewer system as his greatest achievement in life, and it's not crazy to see why. Well, it was only designed to handle 50% growth in London's population. Just 30 years later, it had already doubled, but was still holding strong. It has laid down the foundation for modern London, literally. But well, it was a success. The sewer's design was still affected by some misguided science. Bazalgette's sewers only succeeded in diverting the waste away from London, not getting rid of it entirely. And hence, those downstream complained about the smell and untreated waste entering the river, which perhaps is a small price to pay for Londoners, but a big issue for those downstream. Anyhow, on September the 3rd, 1873, the SS Bywell Castle collided with the SS Princess Alice on the River Thames. The Princess Alice sank and an estimated 650 people died, making it Britain's worst inland waterway disaster. After the accident, an investigation was conducted, which found that some passengers died from drowning, while others died from ingesting sewage. As a result, an effort was made to remove solid waste from the Thames altogether. In 1888, sedimentation tanks were constructed at Crossness to separate the sludge from the liquid waste, where it was then loaded onto barges and sent out to sea. Only liquid waste entered the Thames, hopefully curbing more fatalities, while the solid waste continued to be dumped at sea. From the incarnation of London's Cathedral of Sewage, there have been numerous advancements in disposal methods, causing old pumping stations to close as new waste treatment plants were built. Crossness was closed in the 1950s and just left to decay. Much of the metal rusted or was salvaged well, the pumps themselves were filled with sand to prevent toxic gases from surfacing. The beam engines were too big to move and were left there as the building became victim to vandals throughout the decades. 
Luckily, a group of volunteers found and restored the building in 1987, just as it was listed Grade 1 by Historic England. Today, groups like the Crossness Engines Trust help maintain and restore these pumping stations, allowing people to visit them during open days. But while this pumping station closed down in the 1950s, dumping solid waste in the sea surprisingly lasted longer. In fact, the practice went on until 1998, before it was banned by the European Union. And what of the stink pipes? Well, they also became obsolete as advancements in sewage processing grew, and out of the hundreds that were built, many still remain, albeit in worse shape. Stink pipes are usually found broken in half, far from the days of the towering saints protecting Londoners' noses. Although you can find a rare stink pipe that still stands at full height. Those pipes may even be listed as grade two. Clubs, societies, and websites all take an interest in spotting, logging, and mapping what remains. Most surviving stink pipes are located south of the river and generally follow its path. Just like Bazalgette's sewer system that's still in use 160 years later. And well, it can no longer handle the waste of London alone, it's still the backbone of the 21st century system. And the new additions are equally impressive. For example, the Lee Tunnel is a super sewer built in 2016 to help deal with the raw sewage seeping into the Thames. And it's just temporary, as the Tideway Tunnel, another superstructure, undergoes construction for a 2025 finish date. London's sewers truly were a wonder of the world at their creation, becoming one of the biggest urban sewage management systems ever. It was a revolution in urban planning, featuring a thousand miles of tunnels, hundreds of stink pipes, and millions of bricks. Today, a monument to its creator resides on the Victoria Embankment, suggesting that a lot was done as the result of the great stink. And I don't want to nauseate anyone by going on about this topic more than necessary. So we'll leave it there for today, but thank you all for watching and subscribing. Until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.